Good morning once again, and it's a joy and a pleasure to be with you once again to look into the Word of God. And I'm going to invite you to join me in offering a prayer to our Lord to enable us to go through this message this morning with great clarity and great understanding and knowledge of this issue. Let, let us pray together as we look at the second and concluding part of this subject of walking with God walking with God. We had the first part a fortnight ago and today we're having the second part. So let us pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, I thank you Lord for your mercy and grace in which you have kept us this last fortnight. And dear Father, today as we look into this subject again of walking with thee, illuminate our understanding, O oh God. Let your word come forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may this word be made life and the Holy Ghost in each and every one of us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. For those of you who may not have been part of the first segment of this message, I'll just do a brief recap so that we can move on to the second part and bring these two arms of this message together in context. During the first part of this message, we looked at a very pertinent question which can be found in Amos 3 and verse 3. It said, can two walk together unless they be agreed? Now, the answer to the question is obviously a no. But we went on to look at some depth of why this may be particularly true when it comes to God. And in this particular instance, we looked at 14 perfections of God. We looked at 14 perfections of God that started looking at his eternity and then looked at his freedom. His eternity meaning that he has no beginning and he has no end. He was not caused to come into existence. And nothing of what happens on our planet will affect his existence. We looked at his freedom. That although he has made all things, he remains independent of all his creatures and his creation. God is not obligated to any. 
unless he chooses to initiate an obligation of his own accord. He does not have to do anything for us unless he chooses to do so. We looked at the immutability of God, the unchanging God, reliable, steadfast, same yesterday, today, and forever. We also looked at the infinity of God. He has no bounds. He has no limits. He is not limited even to the universe he has created. And he is not bound by time or by space or any boundary that you can imagine. You cannot put God in a box. We looked at his holiness. And that is a separatedness from all that is common, unclean, and evil. In God, you find the personification of holiness himself. God is holy. There is nothing unclean in him. Nothing has ever or will ever be unclean in him. Nothing evil is totally separate. We also then had a look at love, speaking in particular that God himself is love. It is not what we have come to define in our particular modern age and world as the definition of love. We misrepresent love altogether when we begin to look at love through Hollywood and Nollywood and Bollywood presentation. That is sensual. That is lost. The love of God it's seeking the very highest and best of the object, the person that is loved of God. And there is in the demonstration of the love of God. The love of God is amply demonstrated when Christ is hanging on the cross nailed on the cross, bleeding his life, ebbing away, and yet he can pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is what you call agape, agape love. And then we went on to look at the omnipotence of God. That God is all powerful and able to do anything consistent with his own nature. We also looked at the omnipresence of God. The fact that God is everywhere present with his whole being at all times and closely linked with that is his omniscience that God knows everything everything and then his righteousness The distinction between his righteousness and his holiness is that while holiness relates to God's separateness, righteousness has to do with justice. Justice. And God is the epitome of justice in the universe. 
And when the Bible says, though hand join in hand, the wicked will not go unpunished. God means it. Then we proceeded to look at his simplicity. God is not a composite or compounded being. He has this is speaking more of his essence. Essence that God does not make himself so intricate that you have to be at some height of any special education to be see and comprehend God. No. Simplest being in the universe can relate with God. That's the simplicity of God. The sovereignty of God was the next thing we considered. And this speaks of the position of God in the universe as being chief of all. Then, the supreme power over the universe. He's not a dictator. He gives everyone that choice. And that's why everyone will account. For we shall all give account of the things we have done in this body, whether they be good or bad, says the Bible. And then truth. God is true. It means that he has revealed himself for who he is. He has not withheld any part of his being from being known by us. And everything he has revealed of himself is entirely reliable and true and can be depended upon. Actually, we looked at the unity of God. That there is only one indivisible God. It's not a multiplicity of God. But even when the Bible talks about Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, is the one and only true God. So then, I did say at that occasion that these are not all. This is not an exhaustive list of all the perfections of God. It's just a sample so that you know who is inviting you to walk with him. And clearly, when you see all of these things we have considered of God, when we say he is omnipotent, He's omniscient, he's omnipresent, he's eternal, he's sovereign. Now, clearly, when he's asking you as a human being who is created, who is finite in understanding, who is limited in power, who can only be in one place at one time, unlike the God we are saying, now, clearly, you see, the gap between us and him is not one of equal partners in walking. He's not saying that, okay, you should come and let us discuss and let's see how we can equally... No, 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 no. Even though he brings himself to the position... When he says, come now, let us reason together. He is doing that because of the love in his heart for you, seeing the predicament in which you and I are. And he wants to take us on a life journey with him being by our side. We have not been this way before. 
and we will never come this way again. We have only the one opportunity of this lifetime to go through this life and this way. He alone has the knowledge of the end from the beginning. He alone sees the total picture. He alone knows the way through the wilderness. He alone, who created you and I, knows how best you can function under various circumstances. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our frailties. He knows when we may fall and when we can get up. He knows all of those things. It should be apparent that the reason he is asking for us to walk with him is not because of anything he needs from us. Rather, it is for all we need him for. All that we need him for. And we need to yield to him. We need to yield to him and follow him. And that question again rings out and says to us, can two walk together unless they be agreed? So the obvious implication of that question in the context of the practical situations that we are going to now go through, the obvious implication is that it's we who have to agree with him. Not him agreeing with us to go our own way when we don't know the way. We don't, know the, we don't have the strength to change any situation. But with him, the Bible describes him as the father of spirits with whom we all have to do. The Bible says he is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that raises immediately another fundamental question. Each of us human beings, the Bible says we are made in the image of God. What that means is that there is an image of God in each one of us and the, to the extent that image of God has become blood by the extent we have participated in what has blood that image of God which the Bible describes as sin. Sin has blood that image. Let me try and elaborate. Many of you may find it difficult to follow this example, but if you have many of you, particularly our younger folks, you are so used to the modern information technology age that some of the things I'm going to say now, you may find them a little strange. Because the other day, I took a child and I brought this old dial telephone. And I said, uh, I was reading and looking at this video. The father had said to the child, this was the grandfather talking to the child, he says, dial he called a certain number, 747847, and so on. So the child looked at the phone. He saw the numbers, touching the numbers. And he says, Grandpa, it's not ringing. He says, well, that's because you have not done it correctly. Try again. And he looked at it, and he saw all the numbers. And then again, he went touching the numbers. He says, what did you call the number? I called the number. And he was, that's because the only thing that that child has ever known is the cell phone. 
with the digital touch screen numbers. So when grandpa saw his frustration, he had to bring the phone and show him that you actually move each number and dial them. And he says, oh, how does that work? Of course, that's, <laughs> that's the only thing that he has ever, he has never seen a phone like that. All right? So the same thing with the example I'm about to use. Before every home came lit up with electricity, there was what we used to call a lantern with a kerosene well, a wick that is dipped in the kerosene, and then there is a glass bulb that is around, and then it is locked in place by an upper end and a lower end. And when you light that wick, it draws kerosene from the well, and the light is shining through. And the glass bulb is meant to prevent the wind from blowing that weak lamp. And from time to time, because the kerosene burning produces soot, in time, that glass bulb can become covered with soot. And as it gets covered with soot, the light that shines through it becomes less and less. But the light is still inside. The light is still burning. But when you look from the outside, you see it doesn't show much light anymore. Why? Because the glass through which the light is meant to shine has become covered with black soot. And that light is not shining anymore. And that ball, that glass ball, it can become so dark that very little light escapes from the wick that burns inside. Each of us says we have been hidden in earthen vessels. And these earthen vessels have become polluted, corrupted by sin that hides the light of God inside of us. The nature of God inside of us is hidden. The very presence and image of God that he has put in each of us has become hidden because sin has accumulated so much in our upbringing, in our conception, in our thinking, in our activities. And unless that ball is cleaned out, that light has no room to shine through, reveal the presence of God in each of us. And the only way that that ball can be clean, the earthen vessel, your soul, your spirit man, is through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross at Calvary. Nothing else can claim that sin off to allow that light of God to shine through again. Nothing else, only the blood of Jesus Christ. And as that cleansing process takes place, then we have to learn how to walk again because we've lost the art of walking the way of God. And that's why he has said he wants to come and help us and be our helper. So he sends the Holy Spirit to become resident in us. And the Holy Spirit is that well of kerosene. And that wick of God that is dipped inside the well of the Holy Spirit must draw from the strength of that Holy Spirit and burn again brighter and brighter and brighter so that the nature and the image and the very personification of God may be manifested in us again. And that's what the Bible means when it says the world is groaning, groaning, groaning and looking. Is there a way out of this predicament? They are looking for the manifestation of the sons of God. 
And what the Holy Spirit does, what God does in walking with us is to be an endless source of that strength, that well, the Holy Ghost in us to renew the power and the strength of God in us, which we do not have, which we lack. And it is that strength that enables us to walk with God. And what that means is walking with God, walking the way of God, the way God will walk as exemplified in the person of Christ. When you look at the life of Christ, you see the way he lived. You see the way he interacted with people, the way he taught, the way he knew God, related with God. And that's the way he is inviting us to. That's why the Bible in the chapter we read says what God is really seeking to do is that each of us will become conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And that's why the passage we read tells us that everyone who has made that transition and is now in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation to such a person. That person has passed from death to life. There is no condemnation hanging over that person anymore. In summary, it says, he that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now quickly then, let me summarize to the points that I have taken us so far. What it means is that there are Things we need to put off, put away, in order to agree with God. When we agree with God and we agree to walk with him, then there are certain things we need to put away. And this is what Jesus Christ was referring to. If any man will follow me, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. That's number one. He says, let him take up his cross and then follow him. And he said further, he says, anyone who puts his hands on the plow and looks back, he says, if you start thinking that there is something you are missing and leaving behind that, oh, is comparable to what he's inviting you into, such a person is not even worthy to follow him. And Paul was describing and speaking later. He said, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it even entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. In Jeremiah chapter 9, it says further, it says, the plans that God has concerning you in inviting you to walk with him, he says, they are motivated by thoughts of peace, thoughts of good, not of evil, and to bring to pass an expected end. That which he originally created you for, your destiny, he is going to restore back in your life. He's going to take you with the power at his disposal. There are so many things working against your destiny. There are so many things working against your person. Only God has the power to surmount those forces of darkness that the Bible talks about. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Only God can provide 
the overcoming power to overcome those powers to vanquish them and then bring you to the path of your destiny which he originally created you for and that is only achievable by walking with God it's only achievable by walking with God if you try to walk on your own if you try to do your own thing you cannot possibly achieve those things in your life so you're beginning to see now the blessings and the benefits of walking with God apart from eternal life which he promises to give you at the end of this life that you will have eternal life yet the path of your destiny in this life only God can make it happen in your lifetime let's take one example because of the limitation of time that we have and use that biblical character to illustrate some of these truths that I am referring to we can only do so in the short time that we have and that person of course is one of my favorite characters in the Bible is the person of Joseph now Joseph as you will probably remember his mother's name was Rachel and he came from a family that was in essence polygamous and you know the usual problems of jealousy of envy of rivalry of all kinds of things that happen in a polygamous setting this family was rife with them all there was not no shortage of all of those things in that family and to make matters worse joseph's mother could not have children on time she had to wait and see her older sister which again was very unusual for two sisters to be married to the same man her older sister leah had number one number two number three number four and then five and six and she had had none and she was in desperation finally it says god remembered her and then she finally had joseph and while she was having the second child that she ever had she died in the process of giving birth to the younger brother of Joseph Benjamin but be that as it may Joseph we are told came in the old age of their father Jacob and so Joseph was a child of his old age and he was very very fond of him and of course what that meant was that the older brother who had come earlier all of them became jealous of him wondering why he would be at home while they were out in the field looking after the flock and the animals and why joseph was sitting with their father at home i want to believe that Jacob was planting the word of God talking with him and reading what he knew about the God of their fathers that is the God of Abraham the God of Isaac that is the great grandfather the grandfather and then his father they all had they came to know and understand that there was a covenant that God had made with their family lineage and these were being told them again and again and you will see that amongst all the siblings the Bible speaks particularly about Joseph every stage of his life because of the way Joseph decided to align himself to God and walk with God 
the Bible says, everything that happens after, it says, and God was with him. And God was with him. He was walking with God. So God will obviously be with him. But let's look at a few examples of events in his life. And see what it was that his walking with God enabled him to accomplish. The first thing in his life was that he had dreams early in his life. At the age of 17. And those dreams, he thought he was speaking with siblings. And he did not realize he was only fueling the envy and jealousy that was already rife in them. And the dreams that God gave him, God obviously gave him those dreams, even though he did not understand the way in which those dreams will eventually play out. He didn't understand. He didn't know them. As at the time, at the age of 17, when he had those dreams, he didn't know what they meant. He only knew that, ah, his brethren, I mean, the, the chiefs of his own brothers were bowing to his own chief. He also had a dream that the sun, the moon, and 11 stars, they were bowing down to him. Ha! And when he shared this, they became really very, very angry with him. And they saw, okay, so this thing has gotten into his head. And they plotted to get rid of him. And they said, in so doing, they will see what will happen to this dreamer of dreams. Let me tell you, there is a plan there is a purpose for your life. You may have seen it already either in dreams or you know that there are special abilities that are in you. You may know that there are special investments that God has made in your life to bring to pass an expected end. And sometimes whether you invite it or not, those attributes that have been planted in you will invite enemies, will invite jealousies. And it will cause people to become unduly envious. And they may become problems. They may constitute themselves into deliberate obstacles in your life. And they know there is something about you that is walking out because the hand of God is upon your life. And they are there to obstruct. But the Bible, let me remind you, reminds us, look beyond those human elements or beings who are doing those things. Because the Bible says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. In other words, Satan and his cohorts, demonic entities, powers of rulers of that. They are the ones who see the hand of God upon your life and they want to truncate that process. And they will want to obstruct. They will want to hinder. They will want to delay. That's why the Bible describes him as he came not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's all he does. Going around, prowling around, looking for whom he may devour. But by the grace of God, when you walk with God, you will not be devoured. You will not be truncated. You will not be obstructed or hindered or delayed, as we shall see in the life of Joseph. What may appear as delay, what may appear as hindrance, will actually work out the will of God in your life when you walk with God. That's why we say, that's why in the same passage, if you read it further, it says, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Even to them that are called according to his purpose. 
So walking with God, you will see that in this case, they decided, first of all, to kill him. But a lot of discussions went on. They ended up throwing him down into a well. Fortunately, there was no water in that well. And then, listen carefully, when you walk with God, your whole life is before him. While they were plotting to throw him down the well, the Lord had already set a caravan in motion. That caravan was already walking towards them. And just at the material time he was dropped into that well, the caravan shows up and someone comes up and says, let us um, not kill him, let's, not, let, let's sell him to them. And they ended up selling him to this caravan. Now you can say that that is unfair, yes, in human terms is unfair oh that is wicked yes it is and you may have been going through wicked patches in your life people have done on un unthinkable things to you even in your own household oh yes Jesus experienced it too that's why he says a man's worst enemies are members of the whole his own household it happens Joseph experienced it Joseph was a type of Christ I have shown this before. But then when you see, after they sold Joseph to that caravan, there was the next stage, already arranged by God. They got to Egypt, and there they were selling the slaves. And the household that was to be the next stage in Joseph's life, they came looking for a slave to buy. The house of Potiphar. Mrs. Potiphar had instructed her husband about the kind of slave that he want, she wanted. And they came, and it so happened that that was the household that they sold Joseph to. Again, you will say, oh my goodness, somebody who was a father's favorite, being sold into slavery, into being a house help, oh yes. He was going through a process. But what I want to direct your attention to was that in spite of these terrible experiences, Joseph chose, he chose to remain in the way of God. Not to become bitter, not to become angry, not to begin to engage in retributions of sorts cursing those who had done this to him no he chose not to but he chose rather to walk with God to walk the way of God in spite of the adversities he was facing in life and so in the house of Potiphar he was deploying that nature of God in him doing the very best in that household, diligent in his ways, diligent in his work, and soon Potiphar took notice of him, and he began to trust him. And in fact, Potiphar began to notice that things were getting better in his household because of the presence of this person. Why? Because... He was walking with God. And as God is with him, everything he touches becomes gold. Every work he does turns into gold. So the place where he was walking in Potiphar's house, Potiphar's house was getting blessed, was getting blessed, was getting blessed. So he started giving everything in his household and Joseph soon became overall in charge. But even when such things happen, do not become complacent because the enemy never gives up. Just at that material time, the enemy had entered another agent of his, and this was Mrs. Potiphar. 
The Bible says he, she set her eyes on him. And then whenever they were alone, he started trying to seduce him. Trying to seduce him. Trying to seduce him. And one time he grabbed him and said, lie with me. But Joseph had resolved in his heart, how can I do this wicked thing against God? He was conscious that God was there with him. He was walking with God and God was there with him. So he had chosen to agree to walk with God on his own terms, on God's own terms. He will not do this wicked thing. He will not do this evil thing. And rather, he left his cloak in her hand and ran, ran out naked. And of course, the disgrace of it to Mrs. Potiphar. How can a slave spawn her seductive, you know, moves? She was going to get even with him. She lied about him to her husband and they took him and put him in prison. Sometimes when you choose to walk with God, the enemy, especially when you are steadfast, when you are faithful to God and you are walking and you are uncompromising, the enemy can come and do many things against you and lie about you and cause punishment that you do not deserve at all to come your way. But when they got Joseph into that prison, the Bible says he continued in that prison to walk with God. He continued to go the way of God. He would not become angry. He would not become bitter. Those are themselves outcomes of a choice that Joseph had made to walk with God. He would rather allow the nature of God in him to manifest rather than to allow the flesh in him to take over. That is what it means to walk with God. And soon, the prison controllers and the guards, they recognize that, ah, this is not like all the other prisoners. They recognize that there was something special about this one. And soon they made him to be in charge of all the other prisoners. And for 13 years, he was there in prison for a thing he did not commit. So sometimes we may have made a choice to walk with God and we may find that because of that, we may suffer. And that's what we read that if we have suffered with Christ, we shall also be glorified with him. And when that happened, in God's own timing, in God's own choice of events, two people in the prison had dreams. And he, through the power of the God who he was walking with, interpreted those dreams. You see, when you walk with God and you are doing the things that the choice of walking with God makes you to do in accord with the nature of God, the hand of God is upon all those events. And they are working out the purpose, the destiny of God in your life. And when that interpretation of the dreams that was carried out through him by the power and presence of God in him played out exactly as he had said, one of them was executed as he had said, and the other was released from prison and went back to Pharaoh, the king. But of course, though he bleeded, when you get to the palace, remember me, he did not remember. Two years passed. The arm of flesh will often fail. 
but God's own timing never fails. And it was not until a particular time arose when Pharaoh himself now had a dream, two dreams actually, and no one could interpret them. How can anyone interpret it when it was God who planted that dream in Pharaoh's mind? He hid it from all other people except the one who had been walking with him. So when all other people could not interpret it, it was then he, they remembered that, ah, there was somebody in the prison who had interpreted dreams correctly. And Pharaoh said, send for him. And they brought him. And he, through the presence of God, whom he has been walking with all along, through all those circumstances, he interpreted those dreams. And they were all sure that the interpretation that had been offered through him was the correct one. And they said, now, the implementation of the interpretation, nobody else has the kind of spirits you have demonstrated. You must be the one. And that day, they shaved him, put on new clothes on him, cleaned him up. He was catapulted straight from prison to being the prime minister of Egypt. And now, he was saddled with the role of implementing the agenda that he had now provided Egypt with as a way of securing Egypt from the adversity of famine that was to come upon the land. And he was supervising this. And one day, remember by this time, over 14, 15 years now, the famine had caught up in the land of Canaan. His brothers now came looking for food sent by their father. And they came, and as they saw the ruler of Egypt, they did not recognize him. But he recognized them. And it was his turn to get even with them, to get rough with them, and to punish them, even to kill them if he wanted. But he was with God. He was walking with God. And rather than, than do any of such things with them, he just, his heart just reached out to his own brethren that had done such evil. He thought they thought it and meant it for evil. But God, he realized, did not mean it for evil, that he had sent him ahead to preserve a posterity. When you walk with God, you begin to see into the plans of God. You begin to see through the eyes of God rather than the limited vision that you have as a human being. God begins to show you great and mighty things that you know not of. That's, those are parts of the benefits of walking with God. And when he did, instead of retribution, he loved them. He would serve them with grain and return their money. Even though their conscience began to be guilty when they found the money that they should have paid for the grain, they returned it. And he was trying to see, have these people remained the same? Have they changed? Are they still as wicked as they were to him? He tried many various ways, and he began to see that they had changed. When they began to swear, if we do not bring Jacob back, I mean Benjamin back, let me hang in his place, and so on. He says, ah, they have really changed. And finally, he revealed himself to them. When God is in a person's life, when a person has chosen to walk with God and by the ways of God and they allow the nature of God to, to show forth in them, 
That's what the gospel of Matthew means when it says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God who is in heaven. That God image that is inside of you, when God has cleaned out this earthen vessel and it's shining through, men will see that light and say, God is inside of you. And they will see the light of God inside of your life and they will glorify him. And when they eventually saw and they brought the entire Jacob family, Israel family, over to Egypt, that was what preserved them from the famine that was ravaging the land. And so by one man choosing to walk with God, that family, God's plan that would have been truncated was preserved. And they grew in Egypt and they flourished. They put them in the land of Goshen because of one man, Joseph, who chose to walk with God. When you walk with God, the blessing doesn't just end with you. It spreads to touch many lives. Many lives become blessed. And you lift up many lives. Not just your own life. You touch many lives and you lift up many lives. I could go on and on. But my time is up. But it was the same thing with a man like David who chose to walk with God so that when a man like Saul had been pursuing him, wanting to kill him and exterminate him, when he had the opportunity to get even, to revenge against Saul, the soldiers that were with him said to him, Ah, this is your day. The Lord has delivered this man into your hand. Let me just strike him once and he will be finished. He says, God forbid that I should lay my hands on the anointed of God. That was choosing to walk the way of God rather than the way of the flesh. That's what the passage we read is talking about, that when you walk according to the Spirit, that is walking with God. When you walk according to the flesh, that is walking with the flesh. He says, if you walk according to the flesh, you shall die. But if you mortify the deeds of the flesh and walk in the spirit, he says, you shall live. That's eternal life. And only God can provide you with that eternal life. So in your finances, you can choose to walk with God and do business the way of God. And you may suffer for a while, but when you remain faithful to God, God will bless you, and the blessings of God will be innumerable. In family life, you can choose to walk the way of God, just as we have seen in Joseph. In government, you can choose to walk the way of God, like Daniel. From government after government, keeping to the way. He said he resolved him. From the very beginning, from the very onset, not to defile himself with a portion of the king's meat which had been offered to idols. That is choosing to walk with God. We can mention name after name of men and women who walked with God in the Bible, and there is none of them who ever lived to regret it. Today they are celebrated. They are remembered. Their names are etched out in history, in gold. And they have treasures in heaven. And that's what God is inviting us to, to walk with him. Those are the blessings. Those are the benefits. You have peace in this life. You have the joy of his salvation in this life. And you have the wisdom of God in walking this life. I can go on and on and on and enumerate them. But I am sure you get the point I am making to you. God alone has life. And that's what he meant when he says, I have come, unlike Satan, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And I pray that you will take that bold step. You are the only one who can make that decision. No one can make it for you. 
You are the only one who can resolve within yourself that, okay, just like a group of people did many years ago, and they said, we are going to ask ourselves one question and one question every time we have a situation. What will Jesus do if he was in this situation? And they said they would try it for one year, and they did. And by one year, they found that all the evil attributes with which they had been known had left them. And they began to walk the way of God, walking with God. I pray that the Lord will empower you. I pray that the Lord will uphold you. I pray that the Lord himself will draw you to himself. I pray that the Lord will fill you with the Holy Spirit. Because without that infilling of the Holy Spirit, you cannot possibly engage in the sort of walk we are talking about. And that's why it says, for as many, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And when the Spirit of God dwells in you and is resident in you, he says he bears witness with your spirit that you are a son of God, that you are a daughter of God. Let that witness be always a joyful one. Let that witness be like what the father had with the son when he came up from being baptized and the spirit like a dove came from heaven descending on him and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Let him have that same witness of your life. And when the Spirit is upon you, he can say to you, this is a man after my own heart. This is a woman after my own heart. And this is someone with whom I am well placed. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, almighty and merciful God, we thank you for opening our eyes and showing us a glimpse of what it means to walk with you and for the invitation that you have held out and the promise that you have made that to all those who came to you and to all those who will come to you, you will in no wise cast out. And that as many as received you and believe in the Son, you will give power to become the sons and daughters of God. Father, grant as many as are listening to me today, as many as are watching today, who have been drawn to you, and who have resolved that they want to walk with you the rest of their life, grant them, Lord, that power. Grant them, Lord, that grace and that strength that thy word will be confirmed in them, and that they will truly walk with you all the days of their lives. Thank you for hearing us, Father. In Jesus Christ's name, I have prayed. Amen.